the film, uh, we, we, we made a film together uh, five years ago uh, called Red Light Revolution, and when it was released in the UK, a week later we discovered that there were bootleg DVDs of that movie uh, on the streets of Beijing. And what was more interesting really was that it was not just a carbon copy with the, you know, the poster on the front of the DVD cover, they created their own artwork that actually painted their own, their own cover. Um, and they said that our movie was starring Tom Hiddleston and Rachel Weiss, which is an awesome cast. Um, but it wasn't the cast, yeah, it just wasn't our cast. Um, so they were really good at marketing the movie. Um, and uh, what started, got me thinking, you know, that maybe there's these, some, these sort of uh, bootleggers living in a basement somewhere who see them, who are cinephiles, and they love movies, and they see themselves as movie producers, and that's sort of how the, how, how the, the, the idea began. Are there any questions from Florida? What year was the film set in? Um, the, quite, some time ago. What year was the film set in? Uh, it's set in 97, 98. So, actually, if you want to be completely factual, um, that DVD hadn't entered the market in China yet. Uh, that's the era of VCD in China, which were VCDs were everywhere. But we found when with, with, with the screenplay, when we were showing it around, a lot of people, uh, at least in, in the West, weren't very familiar with what VCD was. So for the sake of uh, artistic license, uh, changed it to DVD. But it was really a huge shift in 97 when video discs hit the market because there wasn't the VHS revolution that we had in the 80s in the West. That China was still quite closed then. So it was really the video discs when they hit the market that the way that people watch cinema pretty much changed forever. Um, yeah, when we were location scouting at first, we were looking all around Beijing um, and there's hardly any of those cinemas left. Uh, so in the end, we had to go further out. And so actually the whole movie, none of the movie is actually shot in Beijing. It's all shot in Hebei province and various different towns and villages around there. And uh, luckily our art department um, uh, had, had scouted that location before. It's actually a factory and next to the factory or inside the factory is a giant Soviet style cinema for the workers. Um, but it was virtually basically abandoned because the factory is a, a government factory. But uh, we could only shoot the film, like when, you sh when we're shooting the cinema, we could only shoot it from the front because it really is in the countryside. We shot it a little bit from the angles, you'd see that there's, there's actually goats and, uh, <laughs> and uh, other things. You know, if in that video when you see him running and he's chased by the, uh, the guy in the red cloak and you see the goats, those are the goats next to the cinema. <laughs> Any question? Yes, please. I'm just curious of why you decided to do a father and son dynamic for the uh, film. Um, well, two, two, two reasons. First, you know, if you're making a movie, I, I thought about bootlegging. You have to bring in the idea of morality somewhere about, you know, is this really the right type of thing to do? So. So it started getting me thinking about about you know well what's the best what's the what's the best sort of uh, character to, to to have to have ponder about morality, uh, and then secondly, um, Melly and I are married. We we had a child two and a half years ago, and uh, and as soon as I became a father, that started making me think about ideas of responsibility and things too. Perhaps I ask Melanie this question. I mean, as a producer, right? You have to you know, pretty much put the project together in the beginning. Um, what are the challenges making film in China? As, you know, I mean, you grew up there, but still, you know, as a, you still treat it as a foreigner in a way. That's true, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a mix uh, in terms of how you treat it and, and how to do it. There's a lot of challenges. Um, I think for this one in particular, uh, one of the challenges was that we're basically doing a period piece. Uh, it's set in the 90s and actually, strangely enough, even though that's not distant history, that's actually a harder period to recreate in China uh, than, let's say, if we wanted to do Tang Dynasty or Qing Dynasty, because there's tons of sets for that and there's tons of um, places you can shoot for that and costumes and everything caters to that for TV. But for the 90s, that, that's kind of this very specific recent history that's been virtually erased or scrubbed out. Um, uh, recently because of all the development uh, that's been going on in China. So that was extremely hard uh, to recreate for us. And I mean, the art department really spent a lot of time finding the cinema that had to be right, uh, finding little sort of things like the trash can, that trash can, the penguin trash can, or those sort of things are very particular to a certain type of place in a certain period. Um, so a lot of those things were, were, were huge challenges, I think. Yes, it's a 
and at the back. Can you sh can you speak a bit louder? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I wanted all the music in the movie to be as if it could be from his playlist. So every single song that appears in the movie, my goal was anyway, that uh, it's, it's, from, it's, it's, it's a soundtrack to a previously existing movie. And we were able to do that with pretty much all of the classical music, but it was when we started getting into the modern music that we, we, we were unable to do it because of copyright issues. So like, I wanted to have music from Rambo, I wanted the movie, you know, when they're watching that movie at the beginning, I wanted it to be Rambo with the music from Rambo, uh, First Blood. Um, and, but, uh, you know, we just, for, for various licensing issues, we, we, we couldn't get the rights. But um, for me, when I, lis I don't really listen to classical music by itself, but whenever I hear a classical piece, it's actually, it, I know classical music through cinema. It's from, you know, I hear a piece, I'm like, oh, that's the song from such and such a movie. And uh, doing research, trying to decide in pre-production what music we would use, you know, I found that it's just fascinating how many classical pieces have been used in, in movies before. It really is like they're, they're siblings. They have, mm -hmm. There's a very special relationship between classical music and cinema because even if you go back to the early days when there was somebody <coughs> playing on the piano, you know, those are old, old songs playing with movies together. Yes. Can you please not uh, talk on the cell phone, please, during the Q&A? Did you have to go through a process with script approval and the Chinese government or anything? <laughs> Um, uh, we didn't. Uh, we, we decided to take the same approach that we did for our last film, which was to make the movie strictly for the internet in China. So the censorship process that it goes through is different. So that means that we will be going through a censorship uh, process, it's just that it'll be happening at the end. So uh, we are yet to see when the movie is released in China, what is going to be cut. But, you know, there, there might be some changes. And do you need to get permission to shoot in the streets, you know, and the uh, location shooting? Um, this is where uh, filming in China is very interesting. I mean, the, there's nobody that's going to come and shut you down, generally, unless you're, unless you're doing some sort of filming that's extremely um, either hazardous or whatnot or um, very obtrusive. Um, but the thing that's very controlled is distribution, so the sales point. So, um, it's actually physically not that challenging to shoot in China. Yes, you know, you should be getting a permit uh, from a, a page one, basically. The and they've actually just changed the process in March, so I think everybody's still trying to get a feel for exactly how it works. But um, you, have a, you have synopsis, which gets approved, and then, and then you do the script, and then you show them the final film um, for, for it to get approved. But, what they control very tightly is basically distribution of whether you can you need a certain permit to be able to sell to television to sell to theatrical uh, to sell to platforms um, so you could theoretically make a film but then it's the it's the selling uh, that becomes actually the the difficult question yes what about cast are you uh, required to use prc uh, no, I mean obviously this is about old Beijing, so it was very important that the uh, the, the actors, uh, uh, the, the, many of the actors speak with a very authentic Beijing um, slang, or you know, they have a very particular uh, accent. So that was really really important um, that it felt authentic. So um, yeah, so we weren't required to, but you know because when we are making a movie about about Beijing, it's, it was sort of a part of the casting process was to find people who. Who uh, who sounded like they were they were from Beijing? Are they all professional actors, or you have non-professional as well? I think they are mostly all professional. Yeah. yeah, they're all they're all professional. So Zhao Jun, who plays the father, he was in our last film as the lead, and then the son is a, a professional sort of child actor. He goes to a theatre school, um, and he was the hardest part to cast, and pretty much the the last major role to cast. Um, through audition, like open, a like casting call? Yeah, and just, yeah, yeah, and just uh, going to different schools, or I went to uh, half a dozen schools around Beijing looking for, for, for kids that were right, and then um, you know, he just nailed his audition. And then also I was really worried too, because they don't physically look anything alike. <laughs> but you, you gotta, you gotta make it feel like they really are father and son. So, uh, so what we did is a couple of days before the shoot, we had them just hang out for a few days. So they went to the arcade together and they did that type of stuff together so they could sort of develop a sort of chummy relationship. I think there was a hand there earlier. Yes. Yeah, uh, speaking to the authenticity, um, it's okay. Um, 
How was the script writing and how was it uh, crafting that dialogue uh, that did channel that authenticity of the slang and the kind of language used by these, these folks? Um, so yeah, I mean in terms of uh, authenticity, I wonder how that is. But um, yeah, no, the, the, the process really is, so I'll write the script in Chinese, we'll translate it, I'm sorry, I'll write the script in English, we'll translate it into Chinese, then we take the script to set and then most of the crew is Chinese outside of the director of photography, basically. Um, uh, and then so, you know, we'll, the, the, the actors will then have the Chinese script and they'll, they'll read it. And not, every so often, particularly Zhao Jun, because he's probably the most experienced actor that we've got on the crew, he'll say, this line here is just too formal. You know, us Beijing is, we'll take this sentence and we'll turn it into something that's usually much shorter and uh, much more, uh, has a lot more flavor to it. So that'll happen through the process. Um, and probably in this film, we didn't do as much improvisation on this one. We did a lot more on the, on the first film. Um, so, you know, I mean, the way I look at it is that, you know, you, when you're making a movie, what you're really looking for is authentic emotions. And for an actor, when, when, if they're given a line, that they read it and they say, this doesn't ring true, and this reads like it's not something that a person would say, which, which is what you get often if it's just a direct translation. You know, it's, it's in the actor's instinct to say, I need to find some way to make this more comfortable. And that happens occasionally. Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for making this film. It's very, very enjoyable. It's really touches my heart. Because I lived thank in you. China for quite a few years and it brings back memory. So I have two questions. The first one is how long did it take you to make this film? The second question is you make three films in China now. So among the three films, how long a period of like how long did it take for the first film, and what kind of obstacles or challenges for the first film, which is quite a few years ago, mm. and the second film and this film. So throughout all these years, China has progressed. China has more become more open-minded. So do you find this third film, in order to handle all these different different challenges, it's a lot more easier? than the first one that you had to handle? Um, it, uh, the first, I guess this movie has taken about, I started running in 2013, so now 2017, so yeah, it's been four years. And then we'll probably, it'll be five years by the time we've, we've finished all of our distribution. Um, five years is pretty much exactly the same amount of time that it took uh, to make Red Light Revolution from script stage to, to the end of our distribution release in, in different countries. Um, in terms of uh, how, uh, uh, what was the, what, the second question? The second question is basically oh, the difference between mm -hmm. and the differences, because it's stretched out in a certain period of time, yep. and knowing China from very conservative, yep. to very restricted, narrow-mindedness towards gradual um, embracing old-mindedness yep. and all that. So among those three films, how kind of, challenges you got from sure. the first film and by the time you get them to the second film challenges. and this film yep. Is it improved sure. a lot or not? Um, I guess uh, the, the first the first uh, films were, were documentaries, so we were selling those. I guess when we were writing them and, and, and directing them, we were trying to uh, sell them to a Western market. So that was where the majority of our audience was was the Western market. And then the shift with Red Light Revolution was we we ended up selling it to Tudo, which in 2012 was one of the top. Uh, internet streaming platforms, and then all of a sudden it, it, it flipped on its head, and we were by far the biggest audience that we had was in China, um, and that's uh, and we don't yet know what's going to happen with this film. The internet audience is going to accept that, or they're going to want more of that, you know, the silly fast comedy the whole way through, which is what we had in the first movie. So uh, the the jury's still out. Just one more question. Um, have you ever thought of um, entering this film to Hong Kong Film Festival? Uh, yeah, yes, we did. We did uh, submit to that, and we, but we, we, we're going to play in the end uh, in Taiwan at a at a big festival uh, next month. Sorry, you have a question? Yes. Uh, who who are the investors in these films? And are you able to make money? 
Uh, it's looking like we're going to make some money on this. Knock on, knock on stage. Well, this is not even real wood. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> That's so appropriate for our film. Um, yeah, it looks like knock on wood that we're going to um, make a profit on this film. Uh, well, this had a really unique uh, sort of uh, seed investment, and that was we, we ran two crowdfunding campaigns. One in English uh, for you know uh, possible uh, crowdfunders in the West, and also one in China that we ran completely in Chinese, uh, pretty much right after. So that gave us the the sort of impetus to start putting the project together. And then we ended up uh, once we had that going, we got uh, a few Chinese investors on board. So um, so yeah, it looks it's looking like we'll be able to, to to have a profit so that we can we can keep on making movies. So you don't have any kind of um, government support from Australia and, you know, because like in Canada when they make films, you have telefilm, right? So this is like crowdfunding and private equity. Yeah, no, this is a very, this has got no uh, Australian government uh, or Canadian government, even though we have Canadians and Australians working on it. We're sort of a bit of a homeless, homeless <laughs> film in that way, you know, like so in Australia they'll look at it and they'll work, there's no Australian content, it's all shot overseas. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to us like an Australian film, and similar with Canada. And then also in China, people are like, oh, there's a foreigner who wrote it, and, you know, it's a Canadian producer, it's not, you know. So we just hope that people like it, even if we don't have a home. Yeah, <laughs> like us, because like we're kind of like third culture kids too, right? So we were always... And, our, uh, yeah. and therefore our films are kind of like third culture children, they're kind of, they, they kind of fit in both worlds, but it's hard to quite peg them, I guess, but that's our background in terms of growing up um, between two cultures. I think there was a hand here. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, throughout your film, I um, felt like I was just watching kind of lost film from the fifth generation of Chinese filmmakers, kind of the early works. So can you talk about your uh, cinematic kind of influences, you know, as you were making this film? Sure, yeah. I, I wanted the movie not to look like it was uh, a historical 1990s. I wanted to look like it was a movie that was made in the 1990s in China, so that you, because there's a, you know there's a big difference between reality and the way that its reality is portrayed in fiction and in cinema. So um, that went uh, all the way to just even just coloring, working with the with the director of photography in the coloring house, which we did uh, at uh, Cao Chengdi in outside of Beijing, which is a sort of arts district. Um, and that was just looking with the coloring team at movie Chinese movies that were made in the 90s and the different, how, the different colors and the different textures that we, we saw on the screen. And so that meant like, instead of like strong blacks, there's a lot of washed out blacks in the movies. These are just little things that hopefully, you know, subconsciously sort of remind you or make you feel like, gosh, where is this, is this, is, do they just, yeah, as you said, like, do they just take this film out of a vault somewhere? So that was definitely one of the, one of the goals. I'm, I'm glad you felt that, that came across. Well, Sam, maybe you can share with us, um, well, earlier at the introduction, I mentioned that your film has traveled to lots of festivals. It started with Tribeca, where it's uh, have your world premiere, then went to LA Film, Asian Film Festival, when you won the Best uh, Director Award, and then, uh, you know, I forget, like, Sydney or Mel Melbourne, and then um, Quebec City, and now to Vancouver. This is the last screening. You had one screening um, over the weekend. So, have you noticed what well, you were not here for the first screening, but I'm just curious about, uh, and you were in London Film Festival just before coming here. So what are the, the reception from the audience? Do you see any difference between these various cities, how the film was um, received in terms of uh, the feedback you get from the audience and from the media? That's a really, a really good question. Um, is it Tri Tribeca was is, is different because it's it's the world premiere. So in the, when you have your, your your opening, like half a lot of the people in the audience are actually industry people. So they're they're not there because they want to see the movie. They're often there because it's their boss who says, "Okay, you got to see all the all the movies world premiering and, and write me a report." So that creates a certain. Um, certain flavor to the audience and then by the time you're playing at festivals like you know Vancouver or London it's more of audience festivals and people are there they're like I just want to have a good time and that's where you get more of the, the sort of belly laughs because people are, uh, are more relaxed and they're not you know they're not there for work <laughs> and would your next film be also set in China or I mean, assuming that you're already thinking about your next film. <laughs> yeah, we're thinking about various projects and, and not sure at the moment. But yeah, well, one of the ideas that we have is to, to, to do what something like, you know, uh, well, uh, I guess so many Chinese films now are shot in different countries, you know, so we could do a, 
do a do a movie that's set somewhere else on on the planet that is still you know is 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 in Chinese with with some of our favorite cast and so not necessarily back in China yeah maybe not not in China yeah. not shoot it in China well I guess we will wrap the session unless there's another question we can take one more question okay. Um, yeah, just a question on the crowdfunding campaign in China. Did you um, see the response uh, benefit you more in terms of financially or in terms of marketing and, and kind of getting the word out and building this interest? Um, yeah, it's actually both. You know, the, like a crowdfunding campaign, yes, you do get, um, you know, money, but the, 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 one of the things that it helps you most is it creates this sort of newsletter and this way to communicate with people who will, you can then reach out to throughout the course of the campaign who then know about it. So that, I think, was, has been really, really helpful. And also in China, because we have WeChats, we now have this WeChat group, so whenever there's, uh, like, news, you know, we can, we can do a shout-out and things like that. So it really is, so crowdfunding is not just money it's it's a way to have have in a way almost an audience or a, a channel where people are listening to you throughout the years so. and was it any different managing a crowdfunding campaign in china versus in the west uh the biggest difference that we found between do you want uh well I'll, I'll say something quickly um is uh the biggest difference that i that we found was that um in the west people might want to support our crowdfunding campaign because they just really like the idea like, oh yeah that's kind of cool Give them, give them ten dollars, and then in China, what we found was it was much more um, uh, based on yes, this is a product that I actually want to buy, and this will, you know, so it's more of a transaction in that sense. So we had less people buying because it was just like, oh yeah, that's cool. So it was, it was that that was the biggest difference between those two campaigns. Yeah, that was pretty much what I was going to say, and um, the only other thing I'd add to that is that it's also very new in China. Um, so the idea of doing crowdfunding and and kind of supporting. Um, something artistic, I think, is still uh, kind of just coming up here. It's 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 now practically established. It's almost the go-to uh, way to you know fund an independent film. But over in China, it's still very new, and I think people are getting used to it. And it only just came out because there were regulations against it for quite a while. Um, so it's kind of just starting up, and, and and so it doesn't have that you know massive crowd base that you would have here. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you to you both for coming, juggling with your parenthood and duties, and trying to make it with all the stew jet lag. And uh, I wish you all the best with your next um, projects. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.